I'm going to show you how to forecast. Um, the example I'm going to use is retail sales data for the US. So this would be um, most similar to like a business forecasting exercise. So um, there's a series on FRED, which is a great resource for United States economic data um, that has retail sales. This is total retail sales in the US monthly from 1992 through December of 2017. Um, and so, you know, maybe pretend that you're running a business and these are your sales numbers over the past um, 25 years or so. All right, so from Fred, we can download the data. I already did that. Um, and before we actually forecast, um, I made some adjustments to the data and I'll explain why. So the data itself, if you look over here, is in um, just number of dollars, like nominal dollars but we know there's been inflation over the past 25 years. Um, so I also read in the consumer price index to adjust for inflation. Um, so this puts the whole series in $2017. Without doing this, we would basically be forecasting for, um, we'd be forecasting both the change in sales and the change in inflation all wrapped into one. So what I'm trying to do by this is isolate um, sales, put it in $2017. That'll make future forecasts easy to understand, easy to interpret, because um, they'll basically be in the same dollars that we're used to dealing with today. Okay, so then once we do that, we have this series that has all the real data. Um, we also know that every month has a different number of days. So if you were doing this for your business, uh, maybe you would want to divide sales per day, divide by the number of days your store or business was open. Maybe you're only open on weekend or weekdays. Um, and so you count the number of weekdays in each month and divide by that. Um, because this is retail sales, you know, most businesses are open every day. Um, and so I divide just by the total number of days in each month. So we go from having real, so backing up for a second, we had the regular value of sales in each month. That would be the value, oops, that would be the value that was on Fred here, right? Adjust for inflation. Now everything's in 2017 dollars, so it'll be easy, easier to interpret our forecasts and our data. And then divide by the number of days in each month to get sales per day. The only thing you have to be careful about here is um, making sure you account for leap years. So some Februarys there's 29 instead of 28 days. Okay. Once we have that, um, copy that data in a new spreadsheet. And we're going to use this sales per day data to make forecasts. So our forecast per month will be sales per day in that month. All right, so let's go into R. So to do this forecasting exercise, I'm using R and R Studio, and I'm going to be using um, a couple of different packages. One developed by Rob Hindman. Um, that's a great forecasting package, and that relies on some work, or the graphics for that um, is ggplot by Hadley Wickham. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up a new script file. And the way I always like to start these is to make a big block comment that's going to describe what we're doing. Okay, so let's write a little note to ourselves about what this file is going to do. So this file loads monthly retail sales per day. This data has been adjusted for inflation. This data has, oh, I think that's good enough. Um, let's say we will use this data to forecast the next two years of sales per day. Right, and then Created by, I always like to leave a note that I'm the one that created it, or you know, if you're doing it, you could write your name and then the date. 2918. All right, so this is easy. Um, only takes a couple seconds, but it's really helpful if you open up this file. Maybe you write it today, you don't open it up again for a couple months. Um, it's just nice to know what exactly you were thinking when you were, when you were writing this code and what its purpose is. All right, so the first thing I like to do, some people disagree with this, but for our purposes, it's gonna be fine. 
let's clear all variables in workspace. So remove. So if we had any variables over here that were already open, um, this would clear out our whole system. Uh, this can prevent us from using variables that we didn't mean to define or that we defined a long time ago. So this will clear out the list of variables every time. Um, next we're going to load the forecasting package. And the new version of the forecasting package is FPP2. If you don't have that installed, you can go to Packages, Install, FPP2. All right. So that will load everything we need, and that will load the GG plot package behind the scenes um, so we can use it. All right. After this, let's go ahead and load the data. And I'm going to I'm going to put the data in a matrix or a data frame called data, um, and then we'll pick an element out of it in a little bit. Um, but all the data will be housed in data, read.csv, and then just the path, downloads, and then the file name, real sales per day.csv. All right, so let's go ahead and save this file. Wherever you want to save it, I'll just save it to my desktop for now. Let's just call this thing real retail forecast. All right, let's run everything, make sure things are working correctly up to this point. So press source, so we'll get some red stuff, but this is just the packages loading in. There's no error message here. And it looks like we have this thing data that if we click on it, we can see it has sales per day and all the dates, just like we had in our Excel file. Okay, so the data read in or loaded in correctly. Next, um, this is time series data. Right? It's one variable measured over time. And so we're just going to tell R that this is time series data. So we're going to declare this as time series data. This will open up a whole universe of operations, functions, packages that will be really useful. Um, and they all rely on the fact that our data is time series data. So this is a really important step. Let's call um, our time series variable capital Y. You could call it whatever you want. I'll call mine capital Y. Function TS declares something as a time series. We want to declare just the second column of our data as time series. So if we look at it again, the sales per day is the, is the time series data that we're interested in. The date, we're not interested in the date. Um, we can tell R to track the date a different way. So we're just interested in this column here. Okay. So that's what this notation is doing. Tell R when this time series starts, 1992, month one, and the frequency. So this data is monthly, it's collected 12 times per year. So now we'll have time series data once we run this code. Um, once we have it in, let's go ahead and make another block. Okay. You can just copy this, paste it, and let's perform preliminary analysis. So preliminary analysis is what you want to do when you first get data. Um, for time series data, graphical analysis is probably the most useful. We can look at things like time plots, um, seasonal plots to investigate if there's seasonality, etc. Okay, so let's do a time plot, which is similar to what we saw. If we go back to Fred, same thing. We're going to be plotting our data over time, but remember we adjusted our data, so it's going to look a little different than the plot on Fred looks like. Okay, so let's do a time plot. We can do auto plot y, and then let's give this a title, so plus gg title, time plot, real US retail sales per day. Um, and let's go ahead and also give this a better y axis label, so y lab for the y label millions of 2017 dollars. 
Okay, and again, this, so now this Y label is going to be informative about the fact that we're using this inflation adjusted data. Okay, so if we press source, um, the plot actually won't come up. There's something you could do that would make the plot come up, but I'm not going to do that. Instead, to make the plot show up, you could highlight the lines and press run. Right, and now it's printed the plot for us. You could click on zoom to get a bigger picture. Um, so a couple things to note, even though this data has been adjusted for inflation, we still have this positive trend over time because sales have been increasing over time. Um, it looks to me like there may be some seasonal patterns. It's hard to tell without doing some more analysis, but um, these look like regular patterns that are happening in the same month every year. Again, we'll investigate that in a second. Um, so we have this upward trend and then Remember what happened in 2008? This was the Great Recession, so the data fell a little bit before it started growing again after the recession ended. Okay, so a really useful plot um, just to kind of get a sense. So we can see the trend, possible seasonality, and maybe this uh, we have one bad recession in our sample. Okay, so again, um, the data has a strong trend. And because it has a trend, we want to investigate transformations. All right, so some of the forecasting methods that we use won't be able to utilize data with a trend. It'll have to be what's called stationary, meaning the data should be flat. Um, and it turns out there's relatively easy ways to make this data set stationary. Um, the trend, if the trend is really strong relative to the seasonality, it can also make it hard to see if there are seasonal patterns in your data. So um, I always like to, before I do any seasonal analysis, transform the data so it's uh, at least getting rid of the trend. All right. Um, let's take the first difference of the data to remove the trend. So the first difference, instead of looking at the raw um, dollar amount of sales, we're going to be looking at the change of sales from month to month. So the first difference would simply be, you know, the change in sales from January 1991 to February 1991. Um, next month, next month, next month, right? So it's just the change of the data rather than the data itself. Right, so let's call this dy, d for difference, and there's a nice built-in function into R, uh, diff, that can take the first difference for us. Okay, now we'll have difference data. Let's go ahead and do another time plot of the difference data, just so we can see what that looks like. So time plot of difference data. And again, this will be the change rather than the raw data itself. So we can highlight all this and press run. And now we have the change from month to month. So again, we now got rid of the trend, the data is totally flat. Um, you know, there's really big fluctuations, but there's no longer a trend anymore. All right. So now that we got rid of the trend, um, let's take a look at seasonality and see if we can find any seasonality in the data. You know, we have these regular, well, we have these fluctuations. We want to see if they're happening in the same month every year or if they're irregular. Um, and that's going to make a difference for how we want to model the data and how we want to make our forecasts. Okay, so series appears stationary used to investigate seasonality. Let me modify this a little bit. Let's say it appears trend stationary. All right, so there's no more trend. Um, so there's a nice, there's a couple of nice functions we can use to investigate the seasonality. Again, these are both coming from this forecasting package. One is GG season plot, um, and we'll see what it does in a second. So the first thing you want to put in is the data. Again, remember we're now using the difference data, dy instead of the raw data. Let's give this a title. So this would be a seasonal plot change. in daily retail sales. 
Okay, so I shortened the title a little bit since it's already kind of long, but I think you get the gist. Um, we can also change the Y label again. So YLab is going to be millions of 2017 dollars. Okay, highlight it, press run. And what are we looking at here? So on this seasonal plot, um, what it's doing, each year gets its own line. So rather than plotting the whole time series over time, we look at one year at a time um, across each month. And so it looks like um, the change from December to January, which would be this January data, looks like there's always a drop. It's always negative, right? Um, the size of the drop may be different in different years, but the data has a very large drop between December and January. Um, so this is suggesting that we have regular seasonality. We also see some clear seasonal patterns here in December where the data is clearly growing from November to December. Um, both of these things, if you think about retail sales, um, what happens in December? Christmas. So there's a big up, there's a build up of sales right before Christmas. Once Christmas ends, retail sales drop off um, and then they slowly start to build up throughout the year again. Okay, so we can see clear seasonal patterns in our data. Um, we could do another seasonal plot. So um, just to show you that there's more than one way to see the seasonality. So let's look at another seasonal plot. And this is called a seasonal subseries plot. GG season, oh, GG sub series plot, dy, and you know you could add the titles just like this. In the interest of time, let's just um, look at the season plot. So what this plot is doing for January, for instance, the first January in our data set is in 1992. So it's plotting, you know, January 90, the change. Uh, January 92, the change in January 93, 94, and it's connecting all those with a line. And then these blue lines are the averages. All right. So again, just another way to see the average change in January is highly negative. The average change in February is positive. Um, and again, December, we see a really big positive change. So it's easy to see from this. Uh, the mean of the data in the different months is very different, depending on what month you're in. Okay. And so again, what this is telling us is that we saw these big fluctuations on the time plot. And indeed, in fact, all these big negative values, it's every January where we see these big drop-offs. So it's a regular pattern that's happening every year during the same month. Um, and that will influence the type of model that we want to use to forecast with. All right. So let's have another comment block summarize what we found and uh, we can continue from here. Taking a little bit because I'm doing the video slowing down my computer. Alright, so our series Y, right, the unadjusted series, our series Y has trend and seasonality. Okay. To remove the trend, we take the first difference. The first difference series still has seasonality. All right. So um, the main thing here is that our series has both trend and seasonality. So no matter what forecasting method we use, we need to consider that when we're choosing our methods. Um, and let's leave another note here. So let's forecast with various methods. Okay, so the first method that we use is a benchmark method. So use a benchmark method to forecast. So benchmark methods are like the simplest possible methods. Um, you know, one benchmark method would be taking the mean of the data and just forecasting every month in the future will be the same as the in-sample mean. For this data, that probably wouldn't work well. You take the mean of the difference data 
Um, it's probably slightly positive, but it's going to be the same value every month in the future. And we clearly have these regular seasonal patterns, so it won't forecast very well because it's going to miss these big swings every January and December. So we're going to have some big misses. Um, another potential benchmark method is a seasonal naive method. That's the one we're going to use. So let's use the seasonal naive method as our benchmark. Seasonal naive method says that the value of the data, so yt equals yt minus s, for example, the value in January of 1994 would be equal to the value in January 1993 plus some random error. Okay. Then, you know, same thing for February. The value in February 1994 will be the same as the value in February of 1993, 1993 um, etc. Okay, so because we have strong seasonality, this will be a great method to use. We do have to be careful. We want to use it for the difference data um, because with the trend data, again, with the raw data itself, which has a trend, we'd be saying we think January 1993 Four would be similar to January 1993, but because we have this trend, um, that's going to tend to miss too low, right? Would miss too low, miss too low, miss too low, etc. So um, we want to use the detrended data or the first difference data, and that way the errors sometimes might be too high, sometimes might be too low, but on average um, are probably going to be close to zero. All right, so let's do fit. And then again, there's a nice function built into this forecasting package, S naive. We we'll use dy, again, the difference data. We can print out a summary of this model fit. And we can check the residuals from this model fit. Okay, so we're fitting this model. When we do that, it comes up with this, we have a new um, object. And this object um, is a container. It's a variable that contains lots of sub-variables within it. There's some built-in functions that will utilize that information correctly. So for example, when we do the summary, a couple things come up. Um, tells us what method we use tells us our residual standard deviation. That's a measure of how well our data is fitting or smaller numbers, numbers closer to zero or better. Um, so let's leave a note. Let's say residual SD equals 287.06. Okay, so this is, this is our benchmark. This relatively simple model that says a year you know, the, the value in the current month is the same as the value in the previous month, or the, the same, sorry, the value in the current month is the same as the value exactly one year ago in the same month. Um, fits the data relatively well, where it's missing on average by roughly $287 million. Is that a lot or not? Um, it depends on your task, and it depends on your data. Okay. Check residuals will give us a sense of how well this data, this model is fitting the data. Um, these residual plots, we want to see that the data looks totally random, which it kind of does up here. ACF, we want to see the residuals, which would be the leftover error terms, the part of the model, the part of the data that the model can't explain. Um, we don't want any autocorrelation over time, so um, this is not ideal. We want all these bars, ideally, to be within these two blue dashed lines, which are the 95% confidence interval. Um, so we have autocorrelation left over in the residuals from this model, which is not a good thing. It means that we're leaving information um, on the table. The forecasting model, seasonal naive model, is not taking, is not using the data as well as it could be using the data. So there's probably a better model out there. Okay, so let's try a different model instead. Again, our goal, we want to forecast well. Um, one guide to how well we'll forecast is the standard deviation of the residuals. And 
how good this ACF plot looks. All right, so let's see if we can find a better model. Uh, the next type of model that we could consider is an exponential smoothing model. Um, exponential smoothing models um, are a class of time series forecasting models. And um, the really cool thing about R, so let's say fit ETS, is that there's a built-in function that will try essentially every single possible exponential smoothing model, and it'll return the one that's best. Um, a cool thing about the exponential smoothers is that we can use the data itself. Some exponential smoothers can allow for trend. So if the data thinks that there is, if the computer thinks that there's a trend in the data based on the tests that it's doing, um, it can include that. So we can use the regular data itself rather than the difference data that we used up here. Okay. Same thing. Um, this is this will produce a model. Uh, a, a variable that's a, a list similar to um, what the seasonal naive method did um, and we can access we can do the same exact stuff so let me just copy this probably faster so I want to summarize the fit ETS and then check the residuals from fit ETS okay, so this might take a second to run because it's going to try out several different exponential smoothing models and then pick the best one Okay, it didn't take too long. This is what the residuals look like. It um, doesn't look like it improved on our benchmark model very much, at least in terms of this ACF. So there's still lots of autocorrelation left in the data. Um, if we scroll up, we can see the model that it picked. Additive error, additive damped trend, and um, additive seasonality. Okay some parameters, and then sigma here, this is the same thing as the residual standard deviation. So let's leave another note. It looks like I spelled residual wrong up above, so let me fix that. Okay, so again, um, smaller numbers of residual standard deviation represent a better fit. Um, so it's a good sign that the residual standard deviation fell. That means this model, at least in sample, is fitting better than the seasonal naive. Although it looks like our error terms still have, they're still somewhat problematic. Again, because these bars are going outside of the 95% confidence interval, that means that there's information in the data that the model is not using efficiently. In other words, we should be able to find a model that does do a better job forecasting um, if it's using all this information efficiently. All right, so let's do one more type of model. Fit an ARIMA model. Okay, so another popular time series model is an ARIMA model. Um, the ARIMA model needs to be stationary. Data, when we use data in an ARIMA model, the data has to be stationary. Um, there's a couple ways we could do this. We could use this differenced data to get rid of the trend um, and then tell the ARIMA method that there's seasonality going on. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways we could do this. One way we could do it, let's say fit ARIMA. Just like the ETS method, there's a nice built-in function from this forecasting package. Um, this FPP package has a function called auto.arima and auto ARIMA We'll try out a whole bunch of different ARIMA methods and return the model that fits the best. Okay. One way we can use this is to use the regular data, even though this data had a trend. Um, we can account for that in our, in our method. The way we're going to do that is we're going to set D equal 1. That tells R, before you fit the ARIMA model, take the first difference of the data. So this is doing behind the scenes what we did manually up here when we differenced the data. Okay, so it's going to do that behind the scenes. We can also get rid of the seasonality by taking the first seasonal difference. Um, and then there's a couple options that I'll set. So let's set stepwise equals false and approximation equals false and trace equals true. So again, we're giving it the regular data, 
um, we're taking the regular difference and the seasonal difference in order to get rid of the trend and seasonality so that our data is stationary. Um, what these two options are doing, stepwise and approximation, this auto REMA method was originally intended to fit a whole bunch of different um, time series. So maybe you have retail sales in 25 different sectors. Um, this, the way this auto REMA function is set up is by default, um, it's going to try to do things as fast as possible. And so when it does things as fast as possible, um, it does an approximation to finding the best model. So it approximates the AIC instead of computing the exact AIC. That saves time. Um, but we don't need to save that much time because we're just considering one, um, one time series. So we can turn that false. Stepwise, instead of literally trying every possible combination of ARIMA models, um, it's only going to try out a few. So it'll modify them a tiny bit, see if it fits better, um, and it's only going to try out a few select models. Again, that will save a lot of time, but we don't need to do that since we're only considering one data series. So we set that option equal false. And then trace equals true is going to print out all the models it's trying down here. Um, so it's kind of cool to watch it work. It's going to take a little while. Let's press run. All right, and then we can watch it work. Again, this will take a little bit. In the meantime, um, let's print the same general statistics that we printed earlier for the other methods. Okay, so we'll print a summary once this is done, and then we'll look at the residuals. Again, hopefully from this ARIMA model, it's the most sophisticated model that we'll consider. Um, hopefully this model can do a better job and get rid of this autocorrelation that's in the error terms. We're going to have to just wait a little bit till it finishes. I think it's almost done. All right, so it just finished. Let's print these summary statistics. Come up here. Tells us what model it picked. Um, some coefficient estimates. This returns the squared error rather than the standard deviation. So if we want the standard deviation, we can take the square root of that number. Okay, so from this model, the residual SD equals 197.8. So at least in sample, this model is fitting the best. Remember, lower standard deviations are better. So the benchmark was 287. ETS improved on that benchmark. And then uh, the ARIMA model did even better than the ETS method. Okay, as far as the residuals, this plot over here, they look a little bit better if we compare to previous. Right. There's not as much autocorrelation, and there's only a couple um, lags that are outside the 95% interval, um, but it's not perfect. So what this is telling me is that of the models we've tried, this is doing the best, but it's not perfect. Um, because there's some leftover autocorrelation, we know that there has to be um, at least one forecasting model out there that does a better job with this time series. But we don't necessarily know what that model is, and it's probably going to be pretty complicated. Um, so what I would recommend is that you try a benchmark, an ETS, an ARIMA model, and then um, choose between those. Again, you could investigate more complicated models, uh, but that's going to require more research and a lot more effort on your part. Um, so of these models, I think the ARIMA model is fitting the best in sample based on the residuals and the standard deviation. Um, so finally, let's forecast. And because the ARIMA model is fitting the best in sample, let's just use that model to forecast. Okay, so we'll save the forecast. It's going to be a, an object, kind of like these fit objects. Um, the function is the word forecast, easy enough to remember. You put in the model fit, so we want to use the ARIMA model, so that's why I'm using this variable. Tell it how far, let's do h equals 24 to forecast 24 months or two years ahead. Then it's very easy to plot the forecast. We can use auto plot. And then 
Uh, let's just do that, and then I'll, I'll talk about an option you could do. So the forecast will form very quickly. Auto plot plots all the historical data as well as our forecasts. And just visually inspecting them, they seem to make sense. Uh, they seem to be in line. You know, it's capturing the seasonal patterns that we tend to see. Um, and it looks like the data is going to keep growing, which has been our past experience over the past several years. So it looks realistic at the very least. Okay. Sometimes it could be hard to, to see these forecasts, so we might want to exclude some of this early data. And we can use the include option to do that in autoplot. So let's say include equals 180 to include the last 180 months. Um, so the last like 15 years of data. Run that. Okay, so now we got rid of some of this earlier data and it helps us zoom in. You know, we could go even smaller, maybe you just want the last five years of data and the forecasts. Oops. Okay, so you can zoom in farther and farther on the forecast if you want. All right, finally we can print summary FCST, and this will print out all the forecast values. So the, another nice thing about the, the default forecast functions in R is that they spit out point forecasts, which are these um, dark lines over here, these blue lines. Point forecast is you know, our best guess of what will happen, as well as associated prediction intervals. Um, so you never want to just rely on the point forecast. You want to give your organization some sense of how far off these forecasts might be. So the default, it'll print out the point forecasts as well as the lower and upper 80% interval, meaning there's, you know, we believe there's an 80% chance the data would fall in this interval at this period, as well as the 95% interval. Okay, so you can get the numerical values by doing this print summary. All right, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, again, what we did, um, we took retail sales data in the US, we adjusted it for inflation, um, investigated its properties, found it has a trend and seasonality, and then we chose appropriate forecasting methods based on the fact that there was trend and seasonality. Uh, we found the ARIMA method fit the best according to our in-sample statistics, and then we used that to form forecasts. All right, so I think that's all I have. Um, if you want more information, I recommend um, if you Google OTEXT FPP, that'll come up with a book that um, Hindman and a co-author have written uh, where this package is coming from and there's a lot more detail about the forecasting methods that I was using today and the process I was following. Alright, so again, hopefully you found that useful and uh, thanks for watching.